I was trying to think about how to inter introduce this, and uh, I, I thought about the idea that, um, <clears throat> you know, when you've, uh, if you've ever been through a prolonged illness and, uh, and they don't know what it is, it, it's not the illness sometimes in and of itself, it's the not knowing. It's, <laughs> anybody, I mean, I've, I've been through that a couple of times. It's, if I knew from the outset, the doctors could say, this is what it is, we know what it is, it's gonna like last nine months, and at the end of nine months, you're gonna be okay, it would have made it a lot easier than going through the nine months, you know, being the guinea pig and doing everything and hoping it all works out. It's kind of the, the not knowing. I mean, if, if you haven't been through that, if you talk to people, uh, the folks I've talked to, and that's my own experience, if I, if I knew from the outset all the bumps in the roads, everything that would happen, and what the outcome would be at the end, it would have made it all a lot easier. And I think that's what Jesus is uh, doing in, in this text for, for believers. Uh, in terms of sharing their faith, and uh, the, the message title is <coughs> Disciples Will Be <coughs> Persecuted. That's a wonderful Father's Day message, isn't it? Uh, we're, we're just really thrilled to hear that. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit of a departure from where we left off. Now, uh, in the beginning of the, of the message, it, uh, it, it came last time on the idea that the the, the fields are white already for harvest. We talked about the, what Jesus uh, felt and saw in his heart in terms of when he looked out on, on crowds and multitudes of people and had great uh, compassion on them because he physically was moved internally. He literally felt something uh, in his own heart when he would look at a, a multitude of people and realize that uh, uh, apart from what he would do for them upon the cross, they're all headed for judgment. And, that, and we uh, spent some great deal of time really breaking down that text word by word. And then he names the 12 apostles that he's sending out and talks about the fact that he's going to basically give him the same kind of powers that he has to heal the sick, cast out demons, so on and so forth. And, uh, and then words of instructions. And, and he says things like, uh, and when you go into a village uh, and they basically reject you, then just shake the dust off and go right into the next one and, uh, and so forth. And that's what they did. And, uh, and we'll, we through the other gospel accounts and in Matthew's account, we'll find that that's what they did. They went out and they did that. People got healed. They came back. They're all stoked. They're all rejoicing. And he even has to remind them, don't rejoice over the work that you're doing for me and the miraculous things, but rejoice because your names are written in heaven. That's what you should really be excited about. You have a personal relationship with me. Now in verse 16, in the same teaching, then it turns a corner, and that's why we've, uh, we've divided it here. Uh, here, uh, the Lord begins to speak about persecution, although again, when, those, when the uh, 12 went out, we have no record of persecution on their tour. Uh, Jesus spoke of a ministry to... Uh, uh, again, for them, only to uh, the house of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, but now he's going to make reference to taking the gospel to, to the Gentiles. Uh, Matthew 10.22 seems to indicate a, a worldwide persecution, uh, and Matthew 23 speaks about the return of the Lord. So there's one thing that's obvious here. When we hit verse 16 in our text this morning, we just turned a corner. There were some instructions that we kind of gleaned from, learned from, uh, in terms of what he was saying to those 12 guys when he sent them out. But now we've turned a corner. We're not just talking about them, obviously, through the text. We're talking about a future time, uh, other people going out, being a, a witness for Christ, and the things that they're going to encounter, which is persecution. And he's going to try to let them know ahead of time what's going to be happening. So when it's happening, nobody's caught off guard. Nobody's surprised. And the big issue is here, he says, and so therefore don't worry and don't be afraid. 
Uh, and, uh, and certainly it's the same uh, for us as we go out to, uh, to share our faith. There's a, uh, there's a lot for us sometimes. In fact, it doesn't take much sometimes to shut us up. <laughs> uh, it doesn't take a lot of intimidation for us to, to just, you know, I think about, um, you, know, uh, you know, when you see a cane spider run across the wall, and of course, if folks are in the mainland, the first time they see them, it's the largest spider they've ever seen in their life, and they're sure it can uh, jump out and kill them on the spot, and it's very terrifying. Uh, and you soon find out that if you even breathe hard on a cane spider, they just wilt. I mean, just a paper towel, anything. They, you know, you just barely hit them, and they just they crumble to, to nothing, and, uh, which is a big relief, of course, the first time you chase down a cane spider, which certainly is a responsibility of fathers on Father's Day. <laughs> But nonetheless, sometimes that's the way we are as Christians. You know, we step out a little bit, talk about Jesus, talk about our testimony, talk about what the Lord's done for us. Somebody says something to us, and we're just like, <laughs> we just like a hurricane spider. Okay, we'll do that again. And Jesus says, kind of get with the program. It's going to happen. It's going to be a little more severe than that. But you're not supposed to worry about it. And certainly, uh, uh, you're supposed to continue sharing your faith. So I've broken this uh, down into uh, to four different points. And the first one is that disciples of Jesus will be extremely uh, persecuted. Warren Wordsby says the work of salvation could be accomplished only by Jesus Christ, and he did it alone. But the witness of this salvation could only be accomplished by his people, those who have trusted him and have been saved. And that's the point. He really sends us all out, as Paul says, as ambassadors. So... Verse 16 to 23 reads, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves, therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard against men. They will hand you over to the local councils and flog you in their synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death and a father to his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me. But you are to stand firm to the, uh, excuse me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. I tell you the truth, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The first thing about this extreme persecution, disciples will be persecuted yet are to be like sheep uh, among wolves. Uh, again, very uh, interesting, this idea that, uh, that normally a shepherd wouldn't be sending the sheep out uh, among the uh, wolves, being that they are the, the predators. And, uh, and it's the idea that it's really a command to do this. Uh, I guess if Sylvester Stallone was Rambo, we're called to be Lambos or something, and the, the attack sheep are supposed to go out and, uh, and deal with uh, the, the wolves, so to speak. But then the instructions with it to help it make sense were to be wise or shrewd uh, as serpents, or some translations would say uh, snakes. Uh, how is a snake shrewd? Well, Genesis 3.1 tells us now, uh, the serp serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. So we're to be crafty, we're to be patient, we're to be uh, even subtle. Uh, this is the opposite of a bull in a china shop in terms of this is an instruction about how do you go out and witness to those wolves around you. Sometimes we use the phrase that, uh, how's work? Man, I'm swimming with the sharks, you know, because, uh, you know, as a Christian and as somebody with some kind of uh, honesty and integrity uh, in a world that has very little or different set of moral values, everybody's got moral values. We've got those that are based on the Bible. People have other moral values that are, that are based on something else, and they come into conflict. We talk often about the conflict of civilizations that are uh, going on in, uh, in our own culture and certainly in the world today. How do we witness to people like that? How do we share our faith with people like that? It's not like a bull in a china shop. Uh, it's, it's with some kind of uh, wisdom. Now, Paul uh, makes a specific reference to this in Colossians 4, 6. And uh, I want to read that to you and then, and then a quote by Charles Spurgeon. Paul says in Colossians, uh, uh, Galatians, excuse me, um, 4.4, 4, he says, be wise, there's our same term, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. 
Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. And again, it's the same context. How do we share the gospel? How do we witness to others when really we're like sheep and they're like wolves? Uh, I mean, uh, they're ready to, to gobble us up. There's a, certainly an intimidation factor uh, here. Uh, Paul says, picking up on the words of Jesus, it takes real wisdom. But at the same time, we've got to be kind of have a heads up and make the most of every opportunity, looking for opportunities uh, in order to be able to, to share our faith. That has a lot to do with, with being a, a good listener, uh, which um, the gals seem to have a little bit of a, a step up on us guys when it comes to, to this. But uh, we need to learn to be good listeners if we're going to be able to figure out what's going on in their lives and how can I appropriately, even though they look like they would not be interested at all, how can I appropriately somehow uh, bring the message of, of Jesus Christ uh, into their lives? Here's the Spurgeon quote. It's kind of lengthy. I've got it for you so you can follow along. But uh, again, classic he says, uh, in terms of sending these guys out and us, he sends them not to fight with wolves, nor to drive them out of their haunts, but to transform them. The disciples were sent to fierce men to convince them, and therefore they must be wise to convert them, and therefore they must be gentle. The weapons Christians uh, are that they are, excuse me, the weapons of Christians are that they are weaponless. They are to be prudent, discreet, wise as serpents, but they are to be loving, peaceful, harmless as doves. The Christian missionary will need to be wary to avoid receiving harm, but he must be of a guileless mind that he do no harm. We are called to be martyrs, not maniacs. Uh, we are to be simple-hearted, but we are not to be simpletons. There's a real contrast here in using wisdom and how to, how to, how to share the gospel. Nobody comes to faith in Christ because you have the ability to beat them over the head with a large King James Bible. Uh, and yet sometimes, that's a metaphor, but sometimes uh, that is the thought, that if I can win the argument, quote enough of the right verses, let them know how little I think of them because I'm righteous in Christ and they're not. I'm on my way to heaven and they're on their way to hell uh, and so forth. Uh, again, we can point out some things to them that may be true, but they're not in love. Uh, and it's, it's really both. It may be in faith, but it's not in love. It takes wisdom in sharing our faith with, uh, with others. Uh, and Jesus says, when you go out and it seems like everybody else is a wolf and you're a sheep, it's okay. Guess what? That's what it's supposed to be like. If you are out there and you're reluctant to share your faith because you feel very Im intimidated, you're supposed to. But that's okay. You're still supposed to share your faith. Uh, and you're supposed to do it with, uh, with wisdom in the way you act towards outsiders, Paul says, making the most of every opportunity, letting your conversation be full of condemnation. No, actually it says full of grace. Uh, be gracious uh, to people, uh, but let, your, let it be seasoned with salt. There's still got to be truth in what you say. We're not to deceive anyone. That's not the idea of the serpent uh, it's the idea of, of using wisdom. And also harmless as doves. Paul uses the same word in, in Romans 6, 18, when he says, uh, everyone has heard about your obedience, talking to the church there. So I'm full of joy over you, but I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent. That's our word, innocent about what is evil. So if I'm a harmless as a dove, that means I'm innocent in regards to evil. Uh, this is talking about the conduct of my, my own life and my own conversation. We're not going to be a witness to anybody, no matter how much we may get over the intimidation factor, uh, if there's not wisdom, but also there isn't a sense of innocence of uh, evil uh, in our own lives. Uh, Paul uses the same word again in Philippians 2.14. Uh, he says, Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. That's, that's the same term. Children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like the stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I, I did not run or labor for nothing. Again, it's a verse about sharing your faith, about witnessing, and it's about being blameless and pure 
uh, again, as we, like stars, reflecting God's love, his truth to, uh, to others. Therefore, do complainers and arguers win a lot of people to Jesus Christ, not according to the Apostle Paul. So it takes some real wisdom, but there's going to be an intimidation factor, Jesus says. Uh, how intimidating? Persecution. To what degree? Sometimes to, to death. <laughs> and yet he says, go for it. Yeah, he says, go for it. But he's going to give some reasons why. Uh, and next he says, to understand, so we know what we're getting into, disciples will be persecuted by leaders. We see that in verse 17. Be on your guard against men. They will hand you over to local councils and flog you uh, in their synagogues. So we're not to be surprised when pressure, persecution comes our way, nor are we to worry about. So Jesus tells us ahead of time the two sources of persecution. They will be religious leaders. And again, some of the worst persecution for Christians around the world uh, is from religious leaders. And by the way, two-thirds of the Christians in the world today are persecuted. There were about two million Christians that were martyred for their faith last year. We're not talking about theoretical we, we could relegate this to the tribulation. All these things will be happening uh, in, in a very intense way. And we could do that, but we wouldn't be, uh, be being true to the reality of, uh, of the world that we live in. Again, if we teach the Bible and its truth, it's got to be true for us, as well as the Christian that lives in Somalia or Darfur. It's got to be the same. We can't say, here's our little Americanized cultural Christianity that we somehow encapsulate, and this is true for me. It's just true. Uh, and this is the reality that not us in particular, although to some degree, but this is what most Christians live in. This is their life uh, day in uh, and day out. But some of the, Jesus said, the, some of the worst persecution would come from religious leaders. And certainly uh, we see that and, uh, uh, in a lot of places. I, I found it uh, interesting a few years ago when I read some of the Gospel for Asia reports about the fact that in northern India, where there's a, a lot of persecution, uh, now, in particular, since about December, but a few years ago, it was beginning to kind of ratchet up. Uh, it was so much so, the spread of Christianity, that the, the Muslims and the Hindus got together to discuss how to stop the spread of Christianity. These are two groups of people that, <laughs> that have a tendency to uh, uh, kill each other norm normally uh, there in northern India, and they've been doing that for, uh, you know, a, a thousand years or so. They actually had a conference to, to figure out how to stop the spread of, of, of Christianity, religious leaders. Certainly one of the big issues in, uh, in Israel, and this text would uh, uh, make reference to it, is, is the fact that when somebody is from an Orthodox Jewish home and they come to faith in Jesus as a Messiah, uh, they are counted as dead, they are ostracized, and, uh, and so forth. That still happens in Israel, happens in places on the mainland. If you're from that kind of a background and, and it didn't happen to you, praise, praise the Lord for it. And maybe that your, your family is still open to uh, Jesus as the Messiah. That's uh, wonderful, but it does happen. And it will happen uh, in, um, in, uh, in real dramatic fashion, certainly during the tribulation. Uh, the, the liberal church uh, speaks out against us all the time. I mean, every, every Easter, there's some wonderful article in the cover of Time magazine from liberal what are called theologians, they're not really Christians by definition, they haven't been Christians in a long time, uh, again, with some great uh, new quote evidence and dragging something up of how Jesus couldn't have been raised from the dead and this and that. And you read the article and there's no evidence for it and so forth. But again, some of the tremendous attacks against Christianity today becomes from religious leaders that even call themselves uh, Christians in our uh, in our own country, and certainly some of the mainline denominations have, have uh, uh, splintered in two uh, over those issues. Uh, and of course, in the tribulation, the last world religion will be the, the, the persecutor of, of true believers. Political leaders, uh, they will be, be brought before governors, kings, uh, and so forth. And uh, certainly within governments, there's been over the centuries and today, tremendous hostility towards, uh, towards Christians, uh, and uh, there was a, a survey recently done among uh, major universities in this country, and it proved what we always knew. But let me just say this. It was done by a Jewish group, and their concern was, is there anti-Semitism within the university system in the United States? That's what they were looking at. They found out that there wasn't. What they did found out, there's tremendous bigotry towards evangelical Christian. You can be a Christian, but if you believe the Bible is true, there's going to be some professors that are out to get you. That's what 
we've always kind of known that experientially, but this is what this, uh, this recent uh, study actually proved, and it, and it goes on and on. If you want to see real open hostility, just talk about or mention the idea in a classroom today on any level of intelligent design or creation being taught alongside uh, Dar Darwinian theory of evolution. H hostility, they want to kill you. And uh, if you didn't have a chance to see the Ben Stein movie, Expelled, I uh, hope you can get it when it comes out on DVD. It is excellent. And actually, he documents the, the, uh, the, the bigotry and so forth that exists within the scientific world today against anyone. And he interviews several uh, outstanding scholars who were not even for intelligent design, but just printed an article by somebody else, in this case, in the Smithsonian Magazine. That guy was fired. Uh, people that say anything, even outside the classroom, uh, on behalf of God or intelligent design, uh, they lose their tenure, they're kicked out of the university, uh, they are ostracized, they, they uh, uh, take their name, and, uh, you know, again, in terms of their credentials, and these are brilliant men and women. Uh, there's open hostility. Jesus said there would be. Does that mean we're supposed to not share our faith? He says, no, that's what, <laughs> this is a... I told you the stuff is going to be like this. You're going to be like wolves out there or like sheep among the oh, wolves. There'll be an open hostility. I, I got a kick out of this one. Uh, about a year ago, uh, VeggieTales went on NBC. I don't know if you knew that or not. NBC said, yeah, we'd love to have uh, VeggieTales and, uh, and everything. And then they began to show and they had edited out every, every Bible verse and every reference to God. And when they confronted, they said, oh, well, we had to squeeze it into a 23-minute format. That's why we did it. But uh, upon further investigation, <laughs> uh, they had removed every reference. Uh, Bob Bozell, the president of Parents Television Council and Media Research Center, uh, said this. He said, today, no one in network TV fears what the children are watching unless it makes them think about God. <laughs> Everything else is okay. <laughs> <laughs> there's some pretty radical stuff on television, but as long as there's not a reference to God or the Bible, everything else is, uh, is okay. Uh, so what do we do? Well, when this happens, Jesus says we're not to worry about what we're to say, uh, how we're to speak. Uh, and so what's the point? Don't get distracted from being a witness for Jesus Christ. Worry is not helpful <laughs> when it comes to sharing your faith. It's not, it's not helpful for anything, really, but, uh, uh, other than passing the time. But uh, uh, again, it's not helpful. Uh, don't worry about it. Just decide you're going to be a witness for Christ. It uh, doesn't mean you shouldn't think ahead of time about what you're saying. That's not the idea. It just means don't get distracted by, by the opposition. Uh, words will be given you, and, uh, and they will. God is faithful. His Spirit indwells us, and uh, wants us to be a witness for him. And it's so easy to be uh, intimidated. So disciples uh, uh, gets better. The next point is disciples will be persecuted uh, even to death. It speaks about a, a future treachery uh, that again will certainly be happening during the tribulation period, but it's, uh, it's not uncommon today. Brother will betray brother. Father will betray, betray a child, children against their parents and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and this happens. And again, some of the recent surveys, about 2 million Christians uh, a year are martyred for their faith. Many of them are turned in by their children, by their father, by their parents, and so forth. Uh, certainly, uh, predominantly in this case, right now, in Muslim countries, uh, and that could uh, uh, expand to other cultures and religious systems in the future. But Jesus says, but he who stands firm to the end uh, will be saved. I uh, read an article actually quite a while ago about uh, a pastor from Texas named Jim Dennison who was in his college days did a, a summer in uh, East Malaysia. They were having a, a baptism uh, and he noticed that uh, there was some luggage uh, in the back of the church. And he asked the pastor uh, about that. The pastor said uh, of this young gal that was uh, being baptized, her father said that if she's baptized as a Christian, she would never be able to come home again. So she brought her luggage. Uh, so again, these, these are not theoretical. Maybe this will happen. This has been happening throughout the church ages. It's going to continue to happen. Uh, it will certainly increase during the tribulation period. Disciples of Jesus will be extremely persecuted. We're very fortunate that we're that one-third, in a sense, in the Western world, although we see things and the tide turning against us uh, each and every day. 
uh, two disciples of Jesus should expect to be persecuted. And again, if you have the anticipated uh, expectation, know that it's normal. It, it certainly will help when that time comes. Verse 24 to 31, a student is not above his teacher nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the student to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household. So do not be afraid of them. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. And even the very head, hairs of your head were, are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. So Jesus says disciples should expect to be persecuted because of their identity with Jesus. Uh, and he gives uh, three examples. A student is not above his teacher. I mean, if uh, Jesus is the teacher and we're his students and he's persecuted, guess what? Your identity with me is going to cause you to be persecuted. A servant and his master, uh, the, the head of a household and the members of a household. There's a, uh, an identity here. And again, he makes reference to the fact that, again, in the previous chapter, they've made reference to him doing his work in the power of Beelzebub. Now, Beelzebub was a, a, um, uh, a Philistine demagogue and so forth. Uh, but uh, uh, the Jews... Uh, use this name synonymously for Satan. So they, uh, when Jesus is doing miracles, and again, we pinpointed one that only the Messiah could do, then they attributed it to uh, he doing that in the power of Satan. He says, if they say that to me and treat me this way, and you're like my servants, like a member of my household and so forth, certainly you should anticipate uh, the very same treatment because of your identity with me. Secondly, disciples should expect to be persecuted, but should not be afraid. And he gives a couple of reasons. Uh, reason number one, uh, God is the great revealer. Uh, nothing is concealed that won't be disclosed. Nothing is hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, hey, speak in the daylight. What I whisper into your ear, shout from the rooftops. Certainly this is uh, what's implied here is that we're spending time with the Lord and the Lord is speaking to our hearts, and then we've got something to say when we're out there with the wolves, you know, is not with the wolves going, man, I really should have spent some time with the Lord this morning. I didn't know it would be like this. No, Jesus is saying it's going to be like this. There's going to be a tremendous intimidation factor. You're to be wise, make the use of every opportunity you get. And Jesus is saying, those things that I speak to your heart when you're spending time with me, those are the things that are going to be uh, effective in impacting. God is the great re revealer. Uh, it, it seems like uh, everyone is against us. They are, but that's okay because it's only, it's only for a time. Uh, uh, God is the great revealer. 1 Corinthians 4, 5, Paul says, Therefore judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He'll bring to light what is hidden in darkness will expose the motives of men's hearts. That's time each will receive his praise from God. Uh, God is watching. God is looking over. God realizes what's uh, going on and what's uh, taking place. Uh, and he will reveal everything will come to light that you've been through, that you've suffered, that you've gone through. He looks at the motive of your heart, not necessarily what's been accomplished uh, by your words. And he'll reveal those that, uh, again, <laughs> Uh, they're the wolves in, uh, in your lives for who they are. Reason number two, we're to fear God and not man. God is a great revealer. We shouldn't fear. Uh, it's all going to work out in the end. He's going to bring everything to light. We're to fear God uh, and not man. Uh, man can kill the body. God can destroy both body and soul in uh, Gehenna is the term there, or hell. So this is a typical rabbinical argument from the lesser to, uh, to, the, to the greater. Uh, you know, it's kind of like um, my, my knee is sore and, and then I'm working on something and I hit my thumb with a hammer. Uh, my knee is not bothering me at that point. You know what I'm saying? It's just, I, I, I'm speaking from actual experience, actually. Uh, at that point, all I care about, see, this is far greater than that. And Jesus is saying, have a fear of me. You know what, you know what that means? It means be afraid of God. 
Does it mean they have a, a reverential fear for him? Yeah, and it means and be afraid of him because that's who we're going to stand before one day and not some guy that's saying, oh, I think you Christians are all lunatics. Oh, I wish he hadn't said that. You know, uh, you know and these terrible things that we suffer for the Lord. The, uh, uh, you know, it's like, no, uh, we're going to stand before the Lord someday. Jesus says, don't be afraid because uh, everything that's in darkness now will be brought to the light. Uh, and, uh, and don't be afraid uh, because you really should have more fear and reverence for me than the people that you're really concerned about and what they will think of you uh, when you reveal to them uh, that you're a born-again Christian. Reason number three, maybe this is the most helpful, we're to trust God's sovereignty. Uh, you're to understand that God is sovereign, even over persecution. Here are the examples of a sparrow, which was, would be the not, not worth a lot in terms of uh, uh, value economically, uh, sold for a penny, yet there's not a sparrow that falls to the ground, note this, apart from the will of our Father in heaven. Next time you see a bird drop out of a tree, it's like, okay, that was God's will. Uh, we don't really do that, but that, he, says, he says, maybe you're not sure that this is really personal. Did I, did I mention the fact that I know how many hairs are on your head? Of course, that's easier for God for some of us than others. <laughs> Getting easier all the time in my case. So it's very personal. God knows, I know every detail of your life. There is nothing that's going to happen to you or come into your life apart from my will. That guy said that, and God knew it. He did that to me, and God knew it would happen. Uh, if if uh, God has got a hedge about, like we talk about with Job, God has got a hedge about every one of us. God will protect every one of us, absolutely, in the context of his will. And the only thing that gets in is what he, what he allows. Now, sometimes, because of our own sin and rebellion, he'll kind of open the hedge up so we kind of get the idea that, oh, oh yeah, 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 you know, and I, I, I get right with the Lord again. But, but when we're walking faithfully with God, there's a hedge about us. There's nothing that's going to happen to us apart from the will of God. Therefore, is persecution going to come? Yeah. Is difficulty going to come? In sharing my faith, is there an intimidation factor? Absolutely. I mean, sometimes they're not. It's not. It's just like an open door. Pray, praise God. You start to share the, your faith, and it's just the nicest person in the world, and it's just so easy. But if that's the only time we share our faith, we're going to be pretty limited uh, in those that, uh, that we can be a witness for Jesus Christ. Uh, again, one more Spurgeon line. He says, chance is not our creed. The decree of the eternal watcher rules our destiny. And love is seen in every line of that decree. Chance. It's not chance. Chance is not our decree. That's not what we see. As, oh, what a chance meeting I had. That's, it's not a chance meeting. God set the whole thing up. Chance is not in our creed. The decree of the eternal watcher rules our destiny. And love is in every one of the lines of that decree. God is watching. He cares about people. This all starts with Jesus looking on the multitudes and, and is physically aching in, with compassion in his heart is breaking because he sees them headed towards hell if we don't get the gospel to them. And so again, God the Father is looking down a hedge about us. Difficulty certainly, uh, but we can trust his sovereignty. So disciples of Jesus will be extremely persecuted. They should expect to be persecuted. We'll get any better for a while. Number three, disciples of Jesus must be fully committed in order to endure persecution. We see this in verse 32 and 39. Whoever acknowledges before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. 
Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. I say that's commitment. <laughs> How do you endure persecution? You got to be really committed. You got to be really, really committed. Uh, and he gives four instructions here. He asks his disciples to endure by reminding him that he will acknowledge all believers who have been faithful. So this speaks to, the, again, the issue of eternal rewards that will be with the Lord someday. Deny me before men, I'll deny you. Acknowledge me, I'll acknowledge you. And of course, Peter is the classic case in point who denies the Lord. And, and again, Jesus, Jesus doesn't write him off, though, because uh, uh, with, with no show of hands, how many of us denied the Lord or at least an opportunity to share him? It happens all the time. Uh, but again, Jesus goes to Peter, points out what's happened, you know, forgives him, restores him, puts him back in, uh, in ministry and so forth. But uh, how do we endure, uh, live to this kind of a committed level that Jesus is, is calling us to? <clears throat> by the way, by the time Jesus goes from his, the teaching, the crowd gets real thinned out at this point. You know, church, Jesus was never into a church growth thing. You know, he, he kept saying really, really what we call the hard sayings of Jesus. You know, I mean, people are just leaving by the droves, you know, after they're hearing some of this stuff. Uh, and he even says to uh, Peter and the boys, are you guys going to leave too? Remember what Peter said? Only you have the words of life. <laughs> they kind of get it. They're not real thrilled with the idea, but they, they get there's not, there's not a, a, any real recourse to this. They're just going to have to really trust the Lord. Uh, and I think that's what we need to do as well. But again, he's asking his disciples to endure by reminding them uh, that we don't live for this life. There will be eternal rewards. Uh, if we acknowledge him, he will acknowledge us to his Father. Secondly, he asked the disciples to endure by loving him more than their families. It speaks to the idea of loyalty. Christ must come first. But what about my family? I just want to tell you straight out, the best thing you can possibly do for your family is to be totally committed to Jesus Christ. And, and, the, and, the, and a few of us have been around the block a few times, we'll say amen to that. The best father you can possibly be is to be fully committed to Jesus Christ. The best husband you could possibly be is to be fully committed to Jesus Christ. It's Father's Day, and I didn't bring the statistics uh, in front of me, but I can just tell you, uh, if, uh, if a godly mother sets a wonderful example and prays for her kids, and, and dad's not involved, it's, it's like 25, 30% of them statistically. God's not into statistics, but that end up following, uh, following the Lord. But if a dad is involved and, and, and is plugged in, it, it, it jumps to like 75 or 80 percent. There's tremendous power in just being a dad and showing up. Uh, and when there's, a, when there's a dad in particular that is fully committed to Jesus Christ, there's, there's a high probability. Everybody's got a free will choice, but there's a high probability that your kids are going to walk with the Lord. At the same time, you know, we've got Abraham, who, who God tells him at some point in his life, you're too focused on the family. I think he said something like that. Remember, he says, take uh, Isaac and take him up to the mountain because he's needed to show him you love Isaac more than you love me. Keep in mind, Isaac's not a little kid. Isaac's in his early 30s by then, probably. So um, this, this is not talking about, you know, all that you do for your kids. And you got to stay pretty focused on them, you know, just to get them to soccer practice and here and there and try to have meals together. And, you know, you're, you kind of have to kind of gear things around your kids and their activities and, and so forth. But, you know, but there's a point in time where you start, you know, stepping back. So, I mean, Abraham is, is still acting like Isaac is three when he's 30. Not a good thing. Uh, we can make idols of people that we love and care for, according to Jesus. And he says, that is not the, the best thing. That's not a good thing. I read the story and got a, uh, I got a kick out of it. It was 2005. It was in China. The PSB, that's the uh, police, the Public Security Bureau, <coughs> bust into a, um, a children's ministry that was going on, like Sunday school classes, and they, <laughs> they, they arrest uh, 30 kids and, uh, and haul them down to the, uh, the police station. The kids are, are singing, um, you know, Sunday school songs, 
uh, and so they just keep singing them <laughs> in the vans. They just keep singing all these songs, worshiping Jesus, he just loves me, this I know, and all these kind of songs. And then in the police station, they just keep singing all these songs, these 30 kids, driving the police officers crazy. And, um, uh, and they told the kids, um, they wanted them to write, I don't believe in Jesus 100 times, and then they would uh, release them. Uh, and the, uh, the kids instead, they wrote, I believe in Jesus today. I will believe in Jesus tomorrow. And I will believe in Jesus forever, a hundred times. That didn't go over real well. So now they're still singing and they're trying to figure out what to do with these 30 kids. Uh, one mother who was a widow, widower came down uh, and the officers threatened her and said, if you do not deny Jesus, we won't release your two twin sons. And she replied, well, I guess you'll just have to keep them because without Jesus, there's no way for me to take them home anyway. <laughs> And they finally gave up and gave her, gave her the, the kids. Uh, more committed to Christ than, than anything else. Uh, even our families and, uh, will endure difficult times. Thirdly, uh, Jesus asked his disciples to endure by taking up their cross and, and following him. And this, again, speaks to the issue of my daily submission and my life to the Lord, dying to my own selfish needs. If I live a, a, a pretty self-centered life, uh, as a Christian, I'm not going to do well in hard times. Uh, that there's just there's no getting around that. Uh, fourthly, Jesus asked his disciples to endure by giving up their life so that they can find it. And again, if his disciples were to uh, love him more than their families, take up their cross and, and follow him, uh, real life is, is walking with the Lord. Uh, and people are, are, are desperate for it uh, in reality. It's interesting, just... Uh, uh, we were just traveling and, you know, you usually catch a few movies on the planes and because they're all cleaned up and stuff and uh, see what's out there. It's just interesting how much uh, in the media that you see, there's a sense of desperation for people to want something more than this life. You know, there's all the magical things and all the things that go on. People are so desperate that there's got to be more than, than, than this life. Uh, they don't want you to necessarily tell them that it's God. <clears throat> they don't necessarily want to hear about it, but they want something. I mean, they'll, they'll follow almost, almost anything other than that. But uh, again, God has placed eternity in, in all of our hearts. Uh, there, there's a yearning for something that's greater than myself, uh, something that I can uh, be part of and, and belong to. And Jesus says that, and that's walking with me and, and living for me. That's, that's real living. It's eternal life, but as Jesus says, it's a life with meaning that's greater than yourself. Uh, it's, it's abundant life. I, um, a lot of quotes here, but uh, this is from a Serbian pastor, uh, Nikolai Velimik, Velimikrovic. <laughs> that's the best I can do. Not good with those Eastern European names. I want to read from this guy because uh, it kind of comes to case in point. Uh, he's arrested uh, in about 1944 uh, because he is, uh, takes a stand for Jesus Christ against uh, Nazism, which most people didn't. Just by the way, the evangelical church in Germany, they were, they were like the cane spiders. Hitler came on the scene, began uh, cozying up to them, uh, and then eventually when he comes to power, turns against them. Uh, they're aware of what's going on with the, with the Jews and so forth. And basically the evangelical church in, in Germany, with a few exceptions, with a few exceptions, basically just went, uh, I'm just going to act like I don't know and I don't see what's going on. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, of course, is one of the exceptions. <clears throat> He's in New York and he hears about it. And he could have stayed, Right. He flew back to Germany. He says, I need to be with my people. I need to be with my church. I need to exhort them to do the right thing, stand up for Jesus Christ, stand up for truth. Of course, he does that. They arrest him. He stays in prison. Uh, when the allies invade, they execute him before he can be, uh, be set free. But uh, very interesting reading his, uh, his sermons from, uh, from prison. This is a Serbian pastor that, uh, that prays this in the midst of being imprisoned in that context of persecution, doing the right thing, the things that Jesus said, uh, said here. He said, uh, bless my enemies, O Lord. Even I bless them and do not curse them. Enemies have driven me into your embrace more than friends have. Friends have bound me to earth. Enemies have loosed me from earth and have demolished all my aspirations in this world. Just as a hunted animal finds safer shelter than an unhunted animal does, 
So have I, persecuted by enemies, found the safest sanctuary, having ensconced myself beneath your tabernacle, where neither friends nor enemies can slay my soul. Bless my enemies, O Lord. Even I bless and do not curse them. You think the people that are persecuted are just a little bit closer to the Lord than we are? I think they are. This guy did the right thing and, and he writes a prayer about how what it did in terms of his relationship with the Lord. Well, that gets us to, to number four. Disciples of Jesus will not be persecuted by everyone. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Some relief here. But again, it, it talks about our own part in this. Verse 40. He who receives you receives me. And he who receives me receives the one who sent me. Anyone who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And anyone who receives a righteous man because he is a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. Just a couple of things in closing here. Jesus equates receiving disciples and receiving himself. Uh, and certainly this is, uh, you know, in a time of persecution, if you were to risk and, and take in a disciple of Jesus Christ and do something for them, Jesus is saying, it's like you're doing it for me. Uh, but I think besides that as well, I mean, when the body of Christ ministers to the body of Christ, uh, we need to see it this way, that, uh, that we're doing it you know, for Jesus, because some people are a lot easier to minister to than others. <laughs> some of those people, I need to see them like Jesus. But, but whatever you do, God is watching, He notices, and He says, and what you do on His behalf for His people, whatever the context, but certainly in the context of a great risk to you, He says, it's like you're doing it for His own self. Secondly, he says he assures a reward will be given to those who receive his disciples. <clears throat> the principle even applies to a cup of cold water to a disciple. That, that's getting pretty basic. I mean, whatever we do for the Lord, there's a reward for it. That, that scope goes all the way to whatever it might be on the big, grander kinds of things to a cup of cold water. Uh, in other words, the, the whole gamut of what we do for the Lord, for God's people, Jesus says there'll be a, a reward for us. Uh, in a time of persecution, some will receive, some will take in, some will care. And we see it in the book of Acts and through Paul's uh, epistles and so forth and throughout uh, church history, uh, and it happens today. Again, what's the big picture for us? We have a tendency to be intimidated. We have a tendency to fear <laughs> the wolves, instead of expecting them. I couldn't witness to those guys. You should have seen those guys. You should hear what they said. These guys hate Christians. There's no way I was going to... Jesus, no, that's kind of what it's supposed to be like. So take your biggest Bible and beat them over the head and get their attention. No, he says, listen, watch, be observant. There was a British missionary that... Uh, 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 you know, 120 or 30 years ago, or whatever it was, came to the big island of Hawaii, <laughs> and uh, before there was really any, any uh, inroads of the gospel there yet, and uh, he lived uh, in Kona, and in his diaries, he talked about the fact that he just walked all over for, uh, I think, you know, a good six or seven months before he ever began to just try to share the gospel with somebody. He tried to look and see and observe and learn so there could be some wisdom then when he uh, began to, to share his faith. Now, you know, you can take that to the extreme that, uh, yeah, I've just been kind of uh, trying to be a friend with my friend. You know, I'm going to share with them. How long has that been going on? About 15 years. No, that's a, little, that's a little too long. You know, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If you don't say it, they don't hear it. They don't hear it. They don't come to faith in, in Christ. That's, that's how it works. You know, there's, there's that, uh, that, that saying, you know, you know, just uh, share your faith, and if necessary, use words. I'm sorry, you got to use words. <laughs> That's the point of this. You got to, you got to tell them. You, you got to use words, uh, and it's just not going to be easy. There's an intimidation factor uh, built into where we live. I want to close with a quote. I want to read it to you. I've got it for you. And then at the end, I want to tell you who it's from. <clears throat> This man says, God assumed from the beginning that the wise of the world would view Christians as fools. 
and he has not been disappointed. If I have brought any message today, it is this. Have the courage to have your wisdom regarded as stupidity. Be fools for Christ and have the courage to suffer the contempt of the sophisticated world. I want to show you who said that. Supreme Court Justice Antonio Scalia. One of the more brilliant men in our, our country. Said it to a group of Christians. But he says, you know what? It doesn't matter where you sit or what kind of credentials you've got. You're still going to be considered a fool for Christ. But you know what? Have the courage to suffer the contempt of the sophisticated world. It doesn't get any easier if you got a law degree or don't have a law degree or you're a public official or you don't. It doesn't get any easier, you know, if you're a housekeeper or something. <clears throat> there's an intimidation factor wherever we're at. There's, there's persecution that uh, is worldwide, and the anticipation is that it's going to get worse. That's what Paul tells Timothy. Man, in the last days that we're living in, <laughs> it's going to get worse. And the tendency for us is going to be like cane spiders. Oh, I got my feelings hurt. You know, and, and, not, and not say anything else again. Well, I tried. I'll pray for another year and then give it a shot again. Or we, again, we, our tendency is to share. And I, the we is, I'm right in here with you. And uh, is that uh, share with the people that we really know are open. <laughs> I can tell, you know, and we do. I mean, I try to throw in there, you know, little conversations to find out where they're at, you know, what their belief system, have they ever gone to church? Are they open at all? Is there any kind of an open door? And sometimes it, there's just not an open door and we need to keep praying. But the, the point is, is that people get saved as we go out as Christ ambassadors and share our faith. And there is a intimidation, there's fear, and there's even worry. And Jesus says, don't fear and don't worry and just go for it, and, and uh, I'll give you the words at, at the right time. And uh, rejection, just shake it off and keep, keep right on going. It's, it's part of, did I mention that this is like normal Christianity here? This is not like the, the elite seven or something like that. You know, this is, Jesus is just kind of laying it out here. But, uh, and I also have to tell you that if I didn't teach right through the Bible, I'd skip this part. <laughs> But that's why we do it. We, we, we got to hear everything that, that Jesus has to say.
and wait for you. Cause there's so many reasons, so many other ways. Sometimes it's hard to hold up under the heat of the day. But you've given me a vision. I've been dreaming this dream. I'm gonna watch and in you. I'm gonna watch and wait for you. Cause it's true, so true. Even the mighty can break, can fall apart. It's true, so true. Even the vigilant can fall asleep in the dark. It's true, so true. That pride can find a place in the purest of hearts. It's in me, it's in you. But by the grace that we've been given, we stand. Watch and wait for you. I will wait for you. Watch and wait for you. I'll give it all back. I'll give it all back to you. You've given so much to me. Every treasure I see, every dream I can see, every promise I hold on to, everything I believe I'm gonna faith in you. I'm gonna watch and wait for you Cause it's true, so true Even the mighty can break and fall apart It's true, so true Even a vigilant can fall asleep in the dark It's true, so true That pride can find a place in the purest of hearts It's in me it's in you, but in the grace that I've been given to stand and wait for you. Watch and wait for you. I will wait for you. Watch and wait for you. Cause it's true. Cause it's true. So true. Even the mighty can break and fall apart, it's true, so true, even the vigilant can fall asleep in the dark, it's true, so true, that pride can find a place in the purest of hearts, it's in me, it's in you, but in the grace that has been given we stand, but in the grace, but in the grace that has been given we stand. Watch and wait for you. I will wait for you. Watch and wait for you.